Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm sorry about the, the I mean, some technical fault. Uh, I'm Dr. Zamanian uh, on behalf of the Canadian uh, Confidentis Group and Bonafarin uh, and the Kisses Implant System. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us for this webinar. Uh, actually, I wanted to thank you uh, because over 40 countries come together uh, and uh, totally we have more than 1,000 uh, participants in all our webinars. Uh, I proudly invite all of you to listen to uh, Dr. Jafari, he's one of the best oral surgeons in Iran. And uh, Dr. Jafari, can I uh, have your speech, please? Yes. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much, Dr. Zamanian, and thank you very much, Dr. Karimi. Uh, I'm so happy to be here as your presenter. Uh, can you say, please, that if my sound is clear and you have the connection good? Yes, 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 that's okay. Thank you very much. With your permission, if anytime you say, I will start my presentation. Thank you, thank you. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Uh, in the name of God, thank you all for participating in today's webinar. Today's topic is about basic implantology, and we will review the surgical protocol and most importantly, the diagnosis and treatment planning in implant dentistry. For those who don't know me, I'm Dr. Mersha Jafari, and I'm a board-certified oral and maxillofacial surgery. And I am so happy to have you today as my fellow companions in this webinar, and I hope it would be a great time. Okay, nowadays, dental implants have become one of the best treatment options for patients in need. Despite its high cost, the benefits which come with it are so significant that nobody can no more omit this option from their treatment plan. So what are dental implants suitable for? In the following slides, we will briefly review these topics which are mentioned in the slide, as you can see. Dental implant is suitable for four major categories. First of all, completely edentulous patients. Second, patients missing posterior teeth. The third one, trauma victims with missing teeth and bone. And the fourth, patient missing a single to it. Some patients may be completely edentulous and demand fixed prosthesis, so we need to rehabilitate the patient with 14 to 16 implants in both jaws. But there are some others who have only lost teeth in maxilla and mandible. As, as you can see, implant surgery had been done in maxilla and natural looking crowns were delivered to patient and his smile is beautiful again. In this case, which is similar to the last one, only eight implants have been used for dental and aesthetic rehabilitation for this lady. But some patients may have lost their teeth for a long time, and because of the vast resorption, we may need to bone graft before the implant placement. As you can see in this case, iliac bone graft was used for vertical and lateral augmentation of maxilla and mandible, and bilateral sinus leaf was performed. And after four months, implants were placed in appropriate locations. And this photo is the pure example of what miracles can be done by implant surgery. But we must know all the basics, the proper treatment plans, so we can deliver a very good and long-standing treatment option to our patients. As we all know, the cost of each implant is high, and everyone may not be able to afford 16 implants. One alternative for them is overdenture treatment. In this treatment plan, four implants in maxilla and two to four implants are placed in mandible, and an implant support removable denture is delivered to the patient. One major advantage in this plan is that there will be no need for sinus lifting or bone augmentation posterior to mental foramen. But this is not true in all cases. As you can see in this panoramic image, the pneumatization of maxillary sinuses is so much, and bilateral sinus lift and bone grafting was inevitable, even for the overdenture treatment plan. This is 
that's the view of an over-denture with all its associated components. Another major advantage of over-denture over conventional denture is not covering the palate. This will give the satisfaction of feeling the taste and heat and cold of the food, and patient's life quality will rise significantly. But the advantages are not only limited to that. As you can see, the aesthetic of overdenture is nothing less than the fixed processes, and patience is at least 10 years younger, in my opinion, after the delivery of the overdenture to her. Implants can be used for less complicated cases too. If there is only one tooth missing, implant can omit the need for crown preparation of healthy teeth in order to give a bridge to the patient. Even they can be used for two adjacent teeth or even for a bridge with a pontic. And here is another patient which we use dental implants to skip the alveolar cleft surgery which had been done near the lateral segment of the mouth and we wanted to skip there so we used dental implants in order to skip that lesion. If we extract the teeth and place the fixtures in the same time the procedure is called immediate implantation or fresh socket implantation. As you can see in this patient the right mandibular hopeless teeth were extracted and implants were placed right away which if done properly will reduce the time cause surgery appointments of the patient. Some people will come to our patient and some patients will come to us and they are missing their anterior teeth. Implants are crucial in replacing the teeth in aesthetic zone, whether it's only maxilla or in both jaws. Even a slight change in the correct position or angle of the fixture may have detrimental aesthetic results. And if you are planning to do this kind of surgery, I really suggest you to be certain of your professional ability because solving the complications afterwards is so difficult or even impossible. Nowadays, reducing treatment plan time has come to a new era called immediate loading. In this manner, a temporary restoration is delivered in the same session as the surgery, and the patient will not experience any aesthetic compromise. Here are some examples of fresh socket or immediate implantation. That's where it can be simultaneously with other surgeries done. For example, in this case, we had to perform closed sinus lifting. And in this case, the immediate implantation was done simultaneously by bilateral open sinus lift. So we can see that there are a lot to be done. We have a lot of options. We can give a lot of help to our patients if we know how to do it. So let's go back a little. Let's go to the history of dental implants. In 1952, Professor Brainmark, a Swedish surgeon, while conducting research into the healing patterns of bone tissue, accidentally discovered that when pure titanium comes into direct contact with the living bone tissue, the two literally grow together to form a permanent biological adhesion. He named this phenomenon also integration. Factors required for successful also integration are a biocompatible material at first, the second one, and the implant must be adapted to the prepared bony site with the surgical protocol. The third one, we must do the surgery in a very automatic way. And last, an immobile and undisturbed healing phase for the best also integration to occur. Implant site prepared in bone must be below 47 centigrade to prevent cell damage and death in area. Gap between implant and bone should be much less than one millimeter. If gap between implant and bone is small enough, embryonic bone will rapidly breach gap. If implant is left undisturbed during healing phase, embryonic bone on the implant surface will mature to lamellar load bearing bone. A screw shaped implants are the main use type of dental implants today. They differ in diameter and length, and they may be one piece, which abutment and fixture are fused together, or two piece, which they are apart. At the coronal end of the fixture, we have the micro thread zone. The main logic behind it was to increase the implant bone contact, but there were some studies that it had no significant role and it will even be plaque retaining if any bone loss occur. 
That's why manufacturers try to produce both types of fixtures to please all the customers. Small diameter implants, often called mini implants, are screw-shaped implants with diameters from 1.8 to 2.9 millimeters and lengths ranging from 10 to 18 millimeters. The primary indication for small diameter implants is for treating patients with thin residual ridges that do not allow the placement of standard implants of 3 mm and greater and as a treatment alternative to lateral ridge augmentation. Another design difference is bone level versus tissue level implants. In bone level design implants, this design provides additional flexibility for creation of soft tissue emergence profile of the implant restoration and the color of the implant must be at the level of the bone when it's inserted into the bone. But in tissue level implants, they were developed to increase the distance of the implant abutment interface from the bone surface to provide the required biological bit. Because of the machine surface color, which will be come out of the gingiva, it has some aesthetic compromises. So we are not going to use any of the tissue level implants in the anterior aesthetic segments, but because we can clean underneath it and it has a very cleaning, cleanable uh, restoration delivered to the patient, we usually want to use them under the overdenture treatments or in the posterior mandible and maxilla, which we do not have any aesthetic compromise. The other design difference between the implants, uh, between implants are parallel and tapered form. Parallel sided screws were first documented extensively by Brainmark. In this type, we use graduated drills of increasing diameter and it usually ends with a tapping or thread forming instrument that creates threads that complemented the threads of the implant. For self-tapping designs, the surgical protocol normally dictated an osteotomy that conformed to the inner diameter of the screw, allowing the threads to cut their way into the bone during insertion. But tapered screw designs have increased initial stability and anatomic conformity. It has improved primary stability because it condenses bone in areas of reduced bone quality. So it is somehow advantageous over the parallel sided implants for us. They distribute occlusal forces to adjacent bone to a greater degree than parallel wall types. And the anatomic shape of this design makes perforation of the buccal and lingual bony walls less likely to occur and creates a more favorable opportunity to safely position the implant between adjacent tooth roots. Tapered implants were found to have better primary stability than parallel side implants. Nowadays, the most major companies are still trying to have the manufacture of parallel sided implants continue, but they have added the tapered form to their manufacturer lines too. So they have all the options to choose your best interests. But what about the connection type of implants? The brain mark, which was the first uh, implant, design features an external hex on the implant, which mates with an internal hex on the abutment. So the external hex was on the fixture. In contrast, internal connection implants feature a chamber within the implant's body to which an external projection of the abutment can engage. A screw loosening is a risk for external hex connections because greater lateral forces are transferred to the connection screw and because preload of the screw is the only force that resists occlusal forces. Another beneficial design modification was platform switching. It was first discovered by accident when a dentist didn't have the correct abutment size and used one of the smaller ones he had in the office and saw that the bone loss around that particular implant is much less than the others. So platform switching has been shown to be beneficial in reducing bone loss around implants, and it allows a greater volume of soft tissue at the implant abutment interface to help achieve soft tissue aesthetics. So we now have the criteria to know which implant to choose and what is the different parts and different designs mean. So now that we have our implant and our fixture chosen, we must see which patients we can work on and which patients are not candidates for implant placements. There are some contraindications to implant placement. Before, we must always know that implant placement is not an emergence procedure. It's an elective procedure. So if your patient 
have terminal illness or acute illness or they are during the pregnancy period, you must not do implant surgeries for them. You can postpone it to a better time. Or if they have tumorous radiation, including the implant side for a previous cancer, because the radiation will reduce the oxygen delivery to the site, reduce the cell in that particular position, the bone remodeling will be compromised. So we are, cannot do implant surgery in there. And this always, this also includes people who use bisphosphonate therapy for osteoporosis, for example, in women over 50, which they usually go into some osteoporotic phase, they may use bisphosphonates. And that is somehow, if they are getting it by IV way, it's a contraindication too. And if we are unable to restore our fixture prosthodontically, we cannot only see it as a surgical phase. We must always think of the next phase, which there must be a crown delivered over it. Some people, when they lose their teeth for a long time, the next jaw, the opposing dentition will over erupt and come into the crown space of the lost teeth. So we must always assess the patient very good. So if our patient from medically compromised, medically way, it's not contraindicated for implant placement, we can go deeper and go to evaluation of implant site. The initial film that we will always get for the evaluation of implant site is panoramic radiographs. Panoramic radiographs are usually have some magnification issues and will tell you that, for example, if it's 10, millim 10 millimeters, you may see it in the panoramic view for around 12 millimeters. That's why that too nowadays, cone beam CT or CBCT has become a very, 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 very major role in implant dentistry. And it gives us the proper and the exact amount of bone in width and in length for us for implant placement. The more cortical bone and the denser or cancellous bone is in the site of the implant surgery, the higher implant success we will have. To maximize the chance of success, we must have amount of bone available around our implants. And that is for approximately one millimeter of bone in lingual aspect and two millimeter in the facial aspect. We will get to these anatomy considerations. But what about the cortical bone and cancellous bone? What do I mean? We must see this photo to understand it better. We have four types of bone densities in mandible and maxilla based on the amount of cortical bone and the density of the cancellous marrow. D1 is in the anterior mandible, which has the most cortical bone and the least cancellous bone. D2 and D3 is in posterior mandible and anterior maxilla, and D4, which is the least favorite for implant placement, is in posterior maxilla. When we are placing implants, we must follow some general rules. One of the in the minimum required distance from anatomic structures. In this table, we must we will see some very important numbers. I want to open my pen so I can mark them for you. In buccal plate, we said that we need two millimeters of bone. And in lingual plate, we need one millimeter. So if our CBCT examination tells us that the buccal lingual aspect of the bone is seven millimeters, we are only allowed to maximum use of a four millimeter diameter implant to re retain two millimeters in buccal and one millimeter in lingual. There are some anatomic landmarks that we must be aware of. In posterior maxilla, we have maxillary sinus, so we must stay clear it for one millimeter from the base of it. In anterior maxilla, we have nasal cavity, we must stay one millimeter away from it. In the midline of maxilla, we have the incisive canal, which the incisive nerve, incisive vein, and incisive artery come out of it, and they will innervate and give the blood supply of the premaxilla from canine to canine, the palatal side. We must stay clear of that, or we will impinge on the nerve, or we will have a lot of bleeding. But that is a very nice point, because in over, some overdenture treatments, we can use the midline of mandible. So the midline of mandible is not contraindicated, but the midline of maxilla is contraindicated. We must main, maintain some distance between implant and implant, and implant to the adjacent tooth. To the adjacent tooth, we must maintain a one millimeter distance because it will 
only go and advance into the periodontal ligaments of the adjacent tooth and it will go into external resorption or even becoming the non-vital tooth beside it. And between two implants, we need at least three millimeters of bone so it won't come as a bone resorption and it is essential to maintain these spaces. Implants should be placed a minimum of two millimeter from the inferior alveolar canal. And about the mental foramen, as we all know, the most anterior extent of the bony foramen is frequently located posterior to the most anterior extent of the mental nerve. As you can see in the picture, we have a loop. The most posterior aspect of implant should be placed a minimum of two millimeter from the nerve, as it was mentioned for the inferior alveolar canal. This means that the implant must be placed five millimeter anterior to the most anterior aspect of the bony mental foramen. For example, if you're going to place an implant in canine region and you see in the CBCT that we have uh, the mental foramen in the apical point of first premolar, you must then adjust a five millimeter distance not to impinge on the loop of the mental nerve. If the fixture impinge on the nerve, it should be immediately removed and inserted more above or must be replaced with a wider implant. Otherwise, patient may experience numbness in chin and lip region and may even have a lot of pain to dysesthesia on nerve. Okay, so we have now assessed the minimum bone needed for implant placement. But what if we didn't have the needed amount? If we have the horizontal deficiency in maxilla and mandible, we have different treatment plans to compensate for this lack of bone. In this case, due to traumatic extraction of central tooth, the buccal plate was lost. So we had to augment the bone with lateral ramus bone graft. Or in major deficiency, it may, it may even need bilateral ramal bone grafts to augment a seven teeth zone for correct implant positioning, this will, this will go into the autografts. Autografts mean that you get a graft from the same patient and use it for his or him or herself. The other concept is ridge splitting. In this procedure, the alveolar bone is cut to the cancellous zone with a disc, and we will gradually try to open it up like a book. It will be open like this. Implants can be placed in same session or in a delayed manner. As you can see in the picture, first the cut, sorry, first, uh, okay, let's put the pen mode on again. Oh, okay, first the, the disc is, has opened the bone and after that, we have placed our implants. The implants were not, wasn't, wasn't able to be placed in the correct position because their horizontal deficiency and the lack in mesiodistal bone. For vertical deficiency, we have other options to compensate the lost bone height. For example, in maxilla and mandible, we can put the bone grafts on top of it, which is only bone graft. It's not recommended. We have a lot of resorption in there, but we have the sinus lifting in maxilla or the use of short implants. And in mandible, we have the sandwich technique which we put the graft between two pieces of his own graft, nerve lateralization or short implants, which will be discussed in the following slides. One of the options for vertical rehabilitation of posterior mandible is nerve lateralization. In this method, the buccal plate is removed and the inferior alveolar nerve is relocated laterally and implants will be placed. As you can see in this picture, this is the inferior alveolar nerve, which is getting out of its canal, it's going to be laterally. The downfall of this method is the nerve hypostasia for at least six months after the surgery. And that's why nowadays this method is out of favor by the surgeons because the patients will not accept the numbness and the bad feeling they have only for getting two implants and they demand a better solution. But in posterior maxilla, we can perform the sinus lift procedure, which is a more straightforward procedure and it is done more common with predictable success rates. As you can see in here, we had a very big pneumatization of sinus, but we can use, for example, 12 millimeters implants in length and it has done, it has been done properly. 
as in this case, the sinus had resorbed the bone and we didn't have the minimum amount of length for implant placement. So a bony window was prepared and the Schneiderian membrane of the si maxillary sinus was elevated and posterior maxilla was augmented by xenograft bone material. And four implants were placed in appropriate length, width, and position. Okay, now that we have the essential, it's time to understand the correct position and correct numbers of implants for predictable long-term dental rehabilitation. If you follow the path of the presentation, you see that we first introduce how to choose our fixture, then we go to our patient selection, then we go to our assessment of the site, and if we need any augmentation, and now it's going to the position and numbers. There are five general guidelines for implant positioning, which in the following slides, we will talk about them individually. Guidelines for key implant positioning are, we should never use cantilevers unless we are forced to. We only can maximum of three adjacent pontics. We cannot put three pontics between two implants. We must always put implant in canine and molar rule and the five segment arch rule, which we will discuss in the following slides. The ideal treatment plan should minimize the use of cantilevers. However, in some clinical conditions, a cantilever is the most prudent treatment option. For example, in the edentulous mandible, available bone in the posterior regions may be insufficient for root form implant placement without advanced procedures, for example, nerve repositioning, iliac bone grafting, and etc. The rule of cantilever length is based on AP spread. AP spread means that if you measure the distance between the middle of the most anterior implant to, to the distal part of the most posterior implant, I called it X, you can extend the cantilever 1.5X in length. It will be only used, see, only used if we are forced to. For example, posterior to the mental foramen, we have a lot of vertical bone resorption and we couldn't do anything else for the rehabilitation of posterior mandible. We can use this AP spread rule to use them as cantilevers. Rule number two is the limit the number of adjacent pontics. In most prosthesis designs, greater than three adjacent pontics are contraindicated on implants. The span of the pontics in the ideal treatment plan should be limited in size by reducing the occlusal table and cusp height. If replacing a molar size implant, the size of two premolar size teeth may be used, and we will prefer it to put it on two premolar pontics. As you can see in this picture, all of them are based on three fixtures but the number of pontics are limited to two in each segment. See, for example, in number A, we use three fixtures only for a five unit bridge. That's why, because if we use only the two ends, we will have three pontics, which is not the rule. Or if we want the six unit, we can still use three fixtures. And in the seven unit, we can still use three fixtures. So by proper positioning and proper treatment planning, we can reduce the need for implant placement. Rule number three is implant position in canine site. It is an essential rule to always, always place implant in canine site. Because as you all know, the dental arch have a turn in canine region and a lot of exclusive, excursive motions are based upon canon, like the canon right occlusion module, which you are familiar with. So if you try to replace canine with a pontic, the amount of force that is put upon it will cause a lot of problems for us. So we must always try to put the canine implant there. And I want to, I want you to pay attention to this treatment plan. As you can see, we have lost the lateral, the canine, and the first premolar. As we said, we must always deliver the canine implant. And we did put in the premolar, but in this manner, the lateral is cantilevered. So we don't put an implant in premolar and in lateral region and put the pontic on canine. Canine is very important in treatment planning. 
Another key placement is replacing the first molar with implant. In force distribution department, near 80% of the masticatory force is on the first molar. So it would be detrimental to replace the first molar with pontic, as we said about the canine. So the canine and the first molar are the key points in dentition. That is so essential that even if we want to replace second premolar, first molar and second molar, we may need three fixtures. As you can see in the right pictures, where I've drawn a circle around it. We cannot put a pontic on the molar region. We must replace it. We cannot reduce the cost in any matter that we jeopardize our treatment planning. And last but not least is the five segment rule of dividing the arch. As you can see in this slide, each arch is divided into five parts. First is lateral to lateral incisor, which I put a number on it. The second and third are the canine regions. And the fourth and fifth are the premolar and molar regions. As a rule, we must always place at least one implant in each segment. As an example, in the right picture, you see that the patient had lost first premolar to the first premolar and the implants were placed. We always must put one implant in each segment. So we needed the first premolar in each side on our each side. We needed the canine. So three and four were replaced with implants and we couldn't leave it there because if we left it there, there would be lateral to lateral under pontic and it would be four pontics, which was as we said by the rule number two contraindicated. So they put some implants in the anterior segment too. That is the definition of the five segments of the arch. Okay, now that we know the positions, what about the numbers? Usually, usually a completely edentulous arch is supported by a 12 unit fixed prosthesis extending from first molar to first molar. Rarely are second molars replaced in the processes unless the opposing arch has a second molar present. So if a completely edentulous patient comes to your office, we usually do the positions and numbers based on from six to six, first molar to first molar. Second molar is somehow in implant dentistry, something a lot optional. And usually if we only, only, only have the opposing second molar, we will do the implant for the second molar two. Okay, after that is the choice of width and length of our implant. It is crucial to know this fact that nowadays, due to improvements in implant design and surface treatment, there is not much difference between an eight millimeter implant or a 10 millimeter or a 12 millimeter or a 14 millimeter. What is important for us is the width. As you can see in the right table, the surface area of a wider but shorter implant, for example, this five to 10 millimeters, five in width and 10 in length, is much more than a shorter, uh, some smaller but longer implant. As you can see, this one is 271 surface area millimeters and the other one is 208. The studies have proven that the wider the implant, less stress is located at the crystal bone and less resorption will follow its loading. Greater implant length is beneficial in decreasing stress and strain in the supporting bone. However, a larger implant diameter is more effective. Usually we only use the long implants the lengthy ones, if we do a fresh socket implantation and we want to get the primary stability from deep in the socket. Okay, so if it's only the choice of getting a wider implant or a longer implant, we usually want to get the wider implant because all the studies have proven that it will really reduce the crystal bone loss and the crystal stress put upon the bone. This stress may even cause implant fracture. If you pay attention to this table, you will see that one millimeter increase 
in length may increase the risk of fracture. Sorry, but one millimeter in increase in diameter will reduce it. So it is so important to choose the appropriate implant for each individual tooth. If you have a lot of vertical height to put implant, it's not essential to go for a 15 millimeter implant. With each in millimeter increase in implant length, you are increasing the probability of implant fracture. Implant fracture may be the only comp complication that we cannot uh, solve it very easily. We must remove the fixture and it would be so hard. So this is a guideline you can use for the suggested implant diameter in each part. As you can see, for the maxillary central incisors, they, will uh, they usually recommend the five millimeter diameter implant because uh, as you know, the diameter is not only for getting, the, for reducing the crystal bone. The wider your implant is, the easier is for the laboratory to get the emergence profile needed for the crown. Okay, so if we get, for example, for lateral incisor with a very, very, very small crown and put a five millimeter implant and say that, okay, Dr. Jaffrey told me to get wider implants for better results, that's not right. You must always choose the appropriate width of implant in appropriate length. For example, in lateral incisors, we will use a four millimeter diameter. And when we go to the posterior area, which we have a very bulky crown, for example, in molar areas, we usually want to use some five or six millimeter with implants. There are some thoughts that they say, okay, if we have a, a teeth nearby, we can use it as a bridge and connect it to the implant. Is it correct or is it not? Connecting a single integrated implant to one natural tooth with a fixed partial denture will effectively create an excessively loaded cantilever situation. Because of the immobility of the implant compared with the mobility of natural tooth, when the loads are applied to the fixed partial denture, the tooth can move within the limits of its periodontal ligaments. Complications following it are breakdown of ozone integration, cement failure on the natural abutment, a screw or abutment loosening, and possible failure of implanted prosthetic components. The implant will act as an ankylosed teeth. So if you have a bridge which one column is moving and the other is strictly here and the movement will in time destroy the whole fixture. A straight line or linear arrangement of multiple implants should be avoided as this provides the least biomechanical advantage and is the least resistant to torquing forces caused by off-center occlusor and lateral loads. Implants should be placed in a more curvilinear or staggered fashion, and they must not all be in a linear because the occlusal distribution forces will not be good as if it is staggered or curvilinear. Now that we are all familiar with the treatment plan, the numbers, the positions, and any of them, and the all that we said before, we must now go to the surgical protocol of implant placement. Studies have proven that antibiotic prophylaxis will reduce the amount of implant failure. We must keep in mind that we are putting an external object in the body, and we don't want the immune system to act on it as a foreign body. The antibiotic chosen for prophylaxis should encompass the bacteria most known to be responsible for the type of infection related to this surgical procedure. The usual drug of choice is amoxicillin. We usually use two grams of amoxicillin, which will be four capsules, near 30 minutes before the procedure. The, beam, uh, the patient will swallow the pills and it will get us the prophylaxis we need. If the patient is allergic to amoxicillin, we can use cephalexin or clindamycin. If we are using some procedures which have the involvement of sinus because the bacteria in the sinus are the same as the respiratory system, we must use some, some other antibiotics, which is augmentin or ceftin. Or in, if you have in your country, it's called coamoxy cloth. 
we will use four tablets of Kalamazikala before it. First step of surgery is flap design. The most common technique includes a dull thickness mucoperiostal flap, which may involve the buccal, lingual, and crestal areas. It is essential to completely expose the buccolingual aspect of the bone to understand the correct dimension and mid crest section. If we don't reflect the lingual or palatal flap, the dimension will be delusional and it would force us to place the implant very buccally. For example, if this is the lingual flap and you are so scared of the lingual nerve that you say, okay, okay, I can see the bone, I have the proper dimension, I must, I must go on and put my implant. You don't have the exact buccolingual dimension and because it would be mid crystal here, you would put implant, sorry, you would put the implant here and it would be so near the buccal plate and it would have a lot of aesthetic and functional compromises. Another type of flap is the flapless technique, which has become very popular. In this technique, a tissue punch is used to remove the gingiva at the implant site, and there would be no need for suturing afterwards. Because this procedure is so blind, we must be completely sure of the underlying bone anatomy, and we need at least seven millimeter of buccolingual bone width to ensure the correct placement of implant. There are some advantages and some disadvantages to this type of surgery. The advantages is obviously it's less invasive. It maintains the tissue vasculature because you will not reflect the periostal membrane. There would be no vertical incisions and patient discomfort would be very less. But what about the disadvantages? We obviously will have limited visibility. We cannot see what is going down there it would be cause the overheating of bone because there is no space for the irrigation fluid to get into the drill that it's going to drill into the place. It would be limited access to evaluate the bone if there are some depressions, if we don't have bone and we are uh, drilling in a wrong angle and malpositioning is more common. Without irrigation, Drill temperatures greater than 100 degrees are reached within seconds of the osteotomy, and consistent temperatures greater than 47 degrees centigrade are measured several millimeters away from the implant osteotomy. Osteotomy temperature may rise even up to 130 degrees without irrigation, and as I mentioned before, 47 degrees is the limit for the bone cells to die. For you, for us to get a very good also integration, we need vital bone. Putting an implant, which is not a non-vital element in a non-vital bone will not cause also integration. To minimize the heat generation, at least 15 millimeter per minute of cooled irrigation, esterite saline, which is uh, sodium chloride 0.9% should be used. Distilled water, which we use in the autoclaves, should never be used because the rapid cell death may occur in this medium. And it has been proven that cooling the irrigation fluid, for example, the sodium chloride, will, until it's 10 degrees, for example, if you put it in the refrigerator, it will only cause a one centigrade difference in bone while we are drilling. So it is recommended for us to use the sodium chloride, which was refrigerated before the procedure, and use it as an irrigator fluid. We must keep in mind that in order to prepare a perfect yet vital implant site, we must not directly jump to the last drill. We must always gradually increase the width of our drill to the final drill size and we must always follow the drilling path dictated by the manufacturer in its catalog. Any sudden change in the drilling sequence may chip the bone and prepare a larger site not fitting the implant we had in mind. But as you can see in the picture, the protocol of drilling is different based on the site of the drilling. And if it's a D4 bone, we can use less implant drills. And if it's a D1 bone, you must do all the drilling in the appropriate manner. So now that we want to start, we must adjust the speed of our drilling sequence. Sharabi and colleagues had a study and said that regardless, 
of the method of irrigation. If you do internal irrigation, external irrigation, use a syringe, use the implant motor or anything, at 2,500 RPM, prepared bone have a very, very, very lower temperature rise at when you are using 1,000 RPM or 500 RPM or else. So it's not usually right that if we go in upper speeds, the temperature rise will be more. The other thing that we must keep in mind is the drill method. You must always know that we must not put the drill over the bone and start pushing it until it go into the proper depth. We must only have five minutes, five seconds in each 10 seconds contact between the drill and the bone. And the other thing that is very important, it's called the bone dancing method or pump in or pop, pump up or pump down method, which is called that you drill like this. You don't put it and start drilling. This will cause a lot of heat. And when you go pump up and pump down, it will give the chance of irrigation to go into the bone, clean the debris, make the tip of the drill more cool, and it will help with the procedure of also integration. So if you want to review all the information till now, we can pay attention to this slide. It's a very good table. For irrigation, we said that we must use copious amounts of sodium chloride and it must be refrigerated before use. The drilling technique was bone dancing and gradually with more drills. Drilling a speed is somehow between 1,000 and 2,000 RPM. It's somehow optional if, if you want it. I usually use 1,000 RPM for my own drilling. And the greater drilling time, it will cause the great heat generation. So we must put five seconds in each 10, 10 seconds for it to cool. You must minimize pressure and the insertion torque for implant must be between 35 to 45 Newton centimeter, which will be mentioned further above in further later in our presentation. Okay, so let's go to the drills. The first step one is the pilot drill. With most surgical system, a 1.5 millimeter or a 2 millimeter surgical pilot drill is used to initiate the osteotomy. The osteotomy is made no greater than seven to nine millimeter deep in the bone. It doesn't matter which length of implant you have chosen. We will only go seven to nine millimeters deep. The rationale for preparation of only seven to nine millimeter is the angulation is determined to be non-ideal, then it is easier to modify than if we go all the way down. So, Step two would be the position verification. Position verification is based uh, by a drill, which is called the parallel pin. Once the initial osteotomy is prepared, it is assessed for ideal positioning. If incorrect, the osteotomy location may be stretched to the proper location by a side cutting drill called the Lindemann bear. This bear makes the hole of lung toward the corrected center position, which is ideal for us. After the new position is obtained, it should be deepened one to two millimeter beyond the depth of the initial osteotomy. Okay, so we need to assess the correct position. But what is the correct position? What should we have in mind? As we all know, implants is an object in space. So we need three different angles, the X axis, the Y axis, and the Z axis. The X axis is the mesial distal positioning of implant. Ideally, it is best to allow at least a minimum of 1.5 millimeter from the adjacent tooth root or tooth structure. Implants that are positioned too close to an adjacent tooth root are usually the result of poor treatment planning. For example, if there was inadequate space, poor surgical technique, if it has improper angulation or placement of an implant body that is too Wide. For example, in the middle picture, you see that the canine root had a rotation, had an inclination toward the endentulous space. And if we didn't have it in consideration, you will only attack the root with your implant. Ideally, there should exist three millimeter or more space between any two adjacent implants. When lack of space exists between the implants, the resultant bone loss will be responsible for the loss of papilla. Lack of space may also lead to difficulty in hygiene access, which will result in poor tissue health. Prosthetically, 
lack of space may result in difficulty in obtaining a final impression too. For example, placement of impression transfer copings and seating the final prosthesis. And it would be so detrimental that you can see in this picture, the puppy is all gone, the bone has been lost, and although it has been also integrated and a crown is delivered to the patient, the aesthetic result is awful. Okay. About the y-axis, which is the buccolingual position, ideally, after implant placement, the crystal bone should be at least two millimeter wide on the facial aspect of the implant and one millimeter or more on the palatal aspect. In the anterior region, the ideal angulation for an FP1 or FP2 in the anterior is slightly lingual to the incisal edge. So it would be not, be not the kind that the central of things implant come straight at the incisal point. It must be a little lingual and preferably for the upper, inter upper incisors at the cingulum. But in the posterior region, the long axis of the implant should emerge within the approximate central fossa of the prosthesis for a screw retained or cement retained FP1 or FP2. And for the z-axis and the apicocoronal position, the ideal depth position of the implant platform is more than two millimeters and less than four millimeters below the free gingival margin. Any more than that would create periodontal pockets and less than two millimeters will make an incorrect emergence profile, which is shown in the center picture. So, the belief that we must always insert deep enough until it's under the bone and we can never know, we cannot see the other threads of the implant is wrong. And it is more than four millimeters from the free gingival margin. We must augment the bone, not deepen the implant. So please remember the two to four millimeters apical from free gingival margin. Any off-axis loading on implant may produce a lot of stress on the crystal bone, which may lead to bone resorption and other complications following that matter. The second drill used is approximately 2.5 millimeters in diameter, and we call it the second twist drill, and is an end cutting twist drill required for the initial osteotomy to the required depth. Step four, we use the final shaping drills. Depending on the diameter, multiple twist drills may be used. Usually the final drill will be within one millimeter of the final diameter of the implant diameter. In example, a four millimeter implant will have the final drill size of approximately 3.2. It is included in your surgical kit. The logic behind this design is that we want the fixture to expand the bone as it's getting in position. And if it's the exact diameter as the final drill, we won't be able to get the proper primary stability. Step five, which is an optional thing in some D1 cases or D2 cases, are the most implant press modules and implant necks are larger in diameter than the implant body. The larger diameter often requires a side cutting crest module drill in D1 and in some D2 crystal bone situation to prepare the crystal aspect of the implant osteotomy. This drill is not recommended when the bone density is poor, like D3 and D4. In addition, usually in D1 bone, some implant systems will require the use of a bone tap or thread former to prepare the thread in the bone before implant insertion. The thread formers or taps should use a high torque, slow speed handpiece and rotate it at less than 30 RPM. So as I said before, we want the implant, the fixture to expand the bone and get in position. If our cortical bone is so dense, the tiny implant cannot expand that hard bone. So we need to a little get it wider at the crest with this contrasting drill or crest module, so it will be easier for the implant to get in position to the appropriate length. And step six is the implant insertion. The osteotomy is lavished with sterile saline and aspirated to remove bone debris and any stagnant blood. This advantage of, the advantage of inserting an implant with a handpiece 
is that placement will be more ideal and deviation is less likely, especially in poorer quality of bone. As you can see, we can use either the ratchet or our motor system to insert the bone. But for the ratchet, we must only use our hand and it needs a lot of control, a lot of experience not to deviate the angle of the implant. If the implant is tightened into the osteotomy and significant stress occurs at the crystal area, pressure necrosis may occur and an increase in the divital zone of bone around the implant during the healing period. If this should occur, you must not put a lot of force and try to insert it and say, okay, go in, go in, I did all the drillings, the appropriate type. Some bones may not be expanded at very good amount that we need. In this should occur, the implant may be untreated in reverse, one to two millimeters, and then go again in. After the implants have been placed, we have the option of two-stage versus one-stage surgery. In two-stage surgery, cover screw is tightened over implant and the gingiva is sutured over it. There are some indications for the two-stage surgery. First of all, if we are not sure about our primary stability, or we use a lot of bone grafts and membranes, or the patient may have parafunctions and forces which will be put upon our implant. The advantage of this system is that the implant is submerged and no pressure would be on the site of the surgery and the infection would be less. But the disadvantage is that we have forced the patient to have a second surgery and the healing time will be much longer because the second surgery will need its own time to heal the soft tissue. And because we have to reflect two flaps, the keratinized tissue would be much less versus the one stage surgery. Cover screw may or may not be included in your implant package. You must ask the, your implant distributor whether it is included or not. Obviously, having it is a great thing, and I think it's a determining, determining factor for choosing an implant brand. As you can see in the picture, it is included in the package, and it has been inserted after four implants. It was placed in anterior mandible. Or we may decide to perform a one-stage surgery. If that, after the implant placement, we tighten a healing abutment on the fixture and gingiva is sutured around the healing abutment. If we have favorable primary stability, we didn't have a lot of grafting and people and the patient was cooperative with us, there was no power function, it would be indicated. Advantage is completely in contrast with the two-stage surgery, the advantage is that we don't have the second surgery, the treatment time is shortened, and the health would be, the tissue would be healthier. But the disadvantage is that the healing abutments may be lose one or twice during the healing period, force-related issues which will be put upon the implant, and less space for interim prosthesis. For example, if the patient have lost an anterior teeth and you want to give a transitional interim prosthesis for the healing period, so it would not be essential in this time, if you tighten the healing abutment, there would be no space for it to be done. Choosing the correct size of healing abutment is so important because it has a great role in soft tissue management around the upcoming restoration, and it must not have any contact with the opposing tooth in closure of jaws. Okay, here is a summary of all bone densities and drilling protocols and speeds mentioned earlier. Please pay attention to the last column. This was not mentioned, which indicate the ideal healing time for oso integration before we initiate the prosthetic part of our treatment. The ideal healing time in a deep bone, bone, which was the most favorable for us, was three to four months, and up goes to the D4 bone, was the, which was the least favorite with the least cortical and the least dense cancellus, was five to six months for oso integration is needed before we can go to the prosthetic part. In order to continue to the prosthetic segment, we must first evaluate our implant stability. There are two methods that commonly used to determine primary stability. One of them is the insertion torque, which you can assess while doing the surgery. The second one, which is the gold standard right now, is the RFA, resonance frequency analysis, which would apply a bending load on the implant, which we use some devices like Ostel, like Penguin, and it will give us amount between 1 to 100, which is called the ISQ, 
usually the amount which is given to you, if it's above 65 or 70, is good, and we can go to the prosthetic part of our treatment. The primary stability we achieve in surgery is the mechanical stability, which is in the blue color in here. As the days pass by, bone around implant remodel, and mechanical stability will reduce and biological stability increase. Sorry. After two weeks in which is where the two lines cross, this would be two weeks. Okay. After two weeks, it is the least amount of total stability of implant, and that is the downfall of one surgery. If the patient doesn't follow the, the instructions you give them, and chew heavily on implant in that time, the risk of failure is so high. So as we go up by and the peeling period goes further, the mechanical stability, which was the primary stability, will go down and it will be replaced by biological stability or the secondary stability. There is a debate whether antibiotic after implant placement is needed or not. Studies have shown that the major role of antibiotics are in prophylactic phase, and there is no need afterwards unless an infection occurs. The recommended treatment for intraoral infections are, as always, first is surgical drainage, and after that, systemic antibiotics like amoxicillin and clindamycin incorporation with a gluconate rinse chlorhexidine of must be used for uh, for in order to treat the intraoral infection caused by implants. So, is it fair that we say if I was able to restore my implant, I'm a successful? Is it a success? Sadly, not. As you can see in this table, the quality of our implant treatment is divided into four groups: success, satisfactory survival compromise survival and failure. If we want to have success or optimum health, we may, we may need to succeed in four criteria. We must have no pain or tenderness upon function. We must have zero mobility and no exuda history and under two millimeter radiographic bone loss from the initial surgery. If we have pain or tenderness or we have mobility with suddenly go from success to failure, which is has painful on function and mobility. So the primary things are mobility and pain. What about the satisfactory survival and compromise survival? The differing factor between these are the bone loss, the probing death, or the history of exudate. If in the healing period we have some history of exudate, it will go into compromise survival. If the bone loss was more than two millimeters, but between two and four millimeters, or it was more than four millimeters, but less than half the implant length, it will go between satisfactory and compromised survival. This is a very key sentence written in the parentheses. It's called less than half of the implant body, but more than four millimeters. So if you use a, an extra short implant, for example, a four millimeter implant, and you have two millimeters of bone loss, although it is two millimeters, but it is more than half of the implant length and it will go into failure. That is why that working with short implants is very risky. You must be very perfect. You must have a lot of experience in implant surgery to can go into that part. Thank you for giving me your time and attention to this webinar. This is the following programs in week two of the great A program webinar brought to you by Canadians and Bonafide Payment Group. As you can see, the table is right here and it will be announced in all of our pages and you can follow it. And please follow me on Instagram and send me your feedbacks on the current presentation and ask me any question regarding today's subjects. Have a great night, goodbye. Thank you, Dr. Jafari, for your uh, so informative and great uh, lecture. I'm sure everybody uh, enjoyed it, uh, like you. I really do. And uh, yeah, and uh, I know maybe uh, there are some questions. Uh, please send uh, Dr. Jaffrey's uh, Instagram or send uh, the, your question or comments to us. 
where we ask Dr. Jafari to answer and we will reply them to you. Dr. Uh, um, Adib, do you have any uh, comment can be used? Okay, so first, uh, on behalf of Confidentist, uh, Canadians, and uh, Bonafarin Payvand, I want to thank uh, Dr. Jaffari for this uh, comprehensive and thorough uh, lecture. I myself really enjoyed it. I believe all the attendees also enjoyed this session. <clears throat> I just uh, have one comment uh, regarding the drilling speeds uh, that uh, was mentioned during the lecture. Uh, that as Dr. Jaffari said, uh, there are different numbers in different textbooks. Uh, but I believe the best way is to uh, follow the instruction of the uh, manufacturer, uh, manufacturer for the implant system you use, because you can find different numbers in different textbooks. But the best way is, uh, I believe, to follow uh, the instructions of the implant system. Okay. So, for example, the Stroman system recommends uh, 1,200 uh, for the uh, initial RPM. Uh, some other systems they have different numbers uh, but overall i really enjoyed the the, the lecture and hopefully uh, we have more of dr jaffer in the near future so thank you, very thank much. you guys and uh, stay safe and have a nice day uh, thank thank you. Karim, do you have any comment as well uh, do you have my voice at this time we, yes 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 uh, yeah uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jaffari. And uh, as Dr. Jaffari mentioned, uh, we will have our next week uh, being open within three days. Please follow Canadians and uh, Bonafari uh, Instagram so you guys can uh, be informed about next week program. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you guys for staying with us. Uh, stay safe and see you on our uh, next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you.